So now we'll look at uh, some real ciphers. And we'll first distinguish between uh, two different variants. We're focusing on symmetric key encryption. Both sides use the same key. We'll talk about what is a block cipher versus an alternative, a stream cipher. And then we'll go through in detail a, partic a particular cipher which was very popular, no longer used today, but the concepts of, are still applied, called DES, the Data Encryption Standard. First, we'll get, today I think we'll get through some of the principles, maybe introduce DES. First, of symmetric key encryption ciphers, there are two variants, stream and block. Okay, so let's just mention the difference between stream and block ciphers. And it's primarily about the size of information we encrypt at a time. In both cases, when we encrypt, we take our plain text and we split it into chunks. And we encrypt a chunk at a time. Okay, we don't encrypt it all at once. We say take a sequence of bits, encrypt that, and then the next sequence of bits and encrypt that. And the difference between stream and block ciphers is really the length of that sequence of bits or bytes that we encrypt at a time. A stream cipher encrypts a stream of data, usually one bit or one byte at a time. So if I have, when we talk about a stream, we often think about continuously generated data. Think of a real-time application. Someone's talking in a voice call with someone across the network, uh, and you want that voice, as it's sent, as is binary across the network, to be encrypted. So as you talk, normally, the bits representing your voice, maybe encoded with PCM, are sent across the network. But if we want to encrypt that, as we generate those bits, we encrypt them and then send them. So we're generating a stream of bits continuously as we talk. So one example of stream ciphers is to encrypt that real-time stream of bits. But one bit, or more typically one byte at a time. So let's say an application generates a stream of bits, continuous. Every byte is encrypted and then sent. Or encrypted and then the next byte is encrypted. We'll see a block cipher is similar, but it encrypts larger chunks at a time. And it results in different types of algorithms. Stream ciphers need to be fast, normally. Think of real-time applications, streaming voice or streaming some video across a network. There should be very small delay from when you generate the data until when it's received at the other endpoint. So you don't want to have to wait a long time to encrypt that data. So that's where stream ciphers become useful. What they do is they encrypt one byte at a time, and the typical way they do it is using XOR. So the diagram down the bottom, the plain text comes in. Say a byte of plain text, eight bits. To encrypt, we XOR that plain text with a random sequence of bits. Where we have some algorithm, a bit stream generation algorithm or just a random number generator that generates this what's called cryptographic bit stream. But think of it, a random sequence of bits is XORed with the plain text. What's this? XOR, one time pad. Effectively, we've got the one time pad here. Plain text, XOR with a random stream of bits is our definition of the one time pad. But in practice, usually the random sequence of bits is not truly random. It repeats over time. Okay? That is, maybe we have a million bits which appear random, but then we come back and repeat those same million bits again and keep repeating. So it's not truly random, therefore it doesn't become the one-time pad. It's closer to the Vision Air cipher in that principle of repeating keywords. So XOR, in terms of implementation, is very fast in computer hardware. And that makes encryption very fast. All we need to do is generate random numbers. And there are some fast algorithms for generating random numbers. We'll see some in a later topic. How do you decrypt XOR? 
check exclusive OR. If you encrypt something, and if you take a sequence of bits, XOR it with a sequence of bits, this KI here, and you get ciphertext. If you take that ciphertext and XOR it with the original KI, you'll get the original plaintext. So XOR is its own inverse. So, in fact, encryption and decryption is the same. And again, that's easy for implementations. To encrypt something or decrypt something, you use the same implementation, the same algorithm. So, very simple to implement. You just need some way to generate random bits. Typically used for encrypting data in real time, as we need to send it. We may see some examples of an algorithm or a couple of algorithms of that later. What we're going to focus on is the other one, block ciphers, because they're in fact more widely used. Instead of encrypting a byte at a time, we encrypt typically a block of 64 or 128 bits at a time. Not much difference, 8 bytes or 16 bytes. But it turns out the algorithms are much different. They can be slower although current algorithms and current hardware they're not much slower uh, but they don't depend upon random numbers and random numbers are hard to generate in some cases so that's the advantage of block ciphers the, the way we view a block cipher is we have a b bits of plain text say so 64 bits of plain text and we take a key we have some complex encryption algorithm You'll see complex as we go through some examples. And the output is a B-bit ciphertext, 64 bits in the example. What if we have plain text of length larger than B? What do we do? Let's say B is 64 bits or 8 bytes, and I have 640 bits to encrypt. I have a 640-bit file to encrypt. What do I do? I just break my plain text 640 bits into 10 blocks, encrypt each block at a time, and a simple way is then to join the ciphertext block that comes out, concatenate them together to get the resulting ciphertext. So all block ciphers, we just operate on a small part at a time. To operate on an input which is larger, there are ways to combine the output and in a later topic, we'll see that they are called modes of operation. But that comes up later, how to combine. Block ciphers are typically used for encrypting files. Okay, they're, they're not, it doesn't need to be encrypted in real time. And in fact, nowadays also can be used for streaming data because the implementations are becoming so fast that with block ciphers, it's not much slower than a stream cipher. So let's focus on block ciphers. We take B bits in, and we get B bits out. And the B bits that we get out should be random. Okay, that is, that's what we'd like in our cipher text, so that no one can determine the original plain text, plus some other properties that we'll see. One of those properties of this block cipher is that we need reversible mappings. The cipher essentially takes a sequence of plain text bits and produces a same length sequence of cipher text. It maps one sequence of bits to another sequence. That mapping must be reversible. And the two tables show an example of a reversible and an irreversible mapping. For example, let's say we have two bits of plain text, a two bit block. There are four possible plain text inputs, 0, 0 through to 1, 1. An example mapping that is reversible is that our cipher maps 0, 0 to 1, 1. It maps 0, 1 to 1, 0 and so on for the last two rows. So that's just an example mapping of plain text to cipher text. It's reversible because given the ciphertext, we can uniquely identify the plain text. If the ciphertext is 1, 1, I can decrypt and find out that the plain text will be 0, 0. 
If the ciphertext is 0, 0, I know when I decrypt, it must correspond to plaintext 1, 0. It's reversible. Irreversible would be this example. We map the plaintext values to this combination of ciphertexts. The problem, if my ciphertext is 0, 1, and I want to decrypt, what is the plaintext? Anyone? Well, we don't know. If the ciphertext I have is 0, 1 and I decrypt, the plaintext could have been either 1, 0 or 1, 1. So this is not reversible. And we need a block cipher to be reversible so that we can get the original plaintext out. So a simple property is that our block cipher must be reversible. Otherwise, we can't decrypt. Now something about how many possible mappings are there for a particular block cipher. Uh, let's say we have two-bit blocks, like in this example. So in this case, two bits come in. We have some algorithm that maps it to two bits of ciphertext. The algorithm provides that mapping. It defines the mapping. And the key tells us which mapping to use. So the table I show here is one particular mapping. I could have chosen a different mapping. That is, I could have chosen 0, 0 to 1, 0, 0, 1 to 1, 1, 1, 0 to 0, 0, 1, 1 to 0, 1. That would be a different mapping. And when I encrypt my plain text, I would get different ciphertext as output. So that corresponds to a different key. How many possible mappings are there in this example? Here's one of them. So here's one possible mapping. How many others are there? Anyone can count them? I've got an example that shows and lists them all. And you've got it in your handout. Let's have a look. Uh, I think it's included in your printed handouts. I'll bring it up. I think this is printed on uh, just at towards the end, I hope so, otherwise you have to look on the screen. It's an example of a two-bit block cipher. This, the one we looked at before. Yep, it's there somewhere. Correct, yep. So, this lists all the possible mappings. That is, on the left column here, with two bits plain text, there are four possible plain text inputs. 0, 0 through to 1, 1. And my cipher can produce different possible mappings to ciphertext. So I've listed them all. There's 24. You can see, take plain text. So the first column is the plain text. The next 12 columns are the ciphertext for a particular mapping. So if I take plain text 0, 0, one mapping produces 0, 0 as output. And if I take plain text 0, 1, it produces 0, 1 as output, and so on. So that's one possible mapping. Not a very good one, but it's possible. Not good because it's identical to the plain text. Another mapping is this second column here under K2. So if I encrypted 1, 0, the ciphertext would be 1, 1. And I list all possible mappings. 24. It's, only, it's all possible arrangements of those four values. There are 24 possible permutations of those four values. That's all we've done here. Just any ordering of those four values and we get 24. Which is what? Four factorial. So if we had three bits, 
there are eight possible plain texts. Okay, with three bits block, there are eight possible plain texts. So we would list eight here from 0, 0, 0 through to 1, 1, 1. And the number of possible mappings would be eight factorial, whatever that value that is. Okay, that's the number of permutations. And we can think of each mapping as identifying a key. So what happens with a block cipher is when I want to encrypt something, I choose one of those mappings, or I choose a key. So let's say I want to encrypt using key 7. I take my plain text. If my plain text is 0, 1, and I want to use key 7, then the cipher text will be 0, 0. If I had different plain texts, such as 1, 1, using the same key, the cipher text would be 1, 1. If I change the key to key 14, for example, plain text 0, 1 would map to 1, 1. 1, 1 would map to 1, 0. Okay, so the key specifies which mapping to use. And this gives us all possible mappings, in effect, in in effect, 24 possible keys in this cipher. We can think of the key, so remember one of the problems is that if A chooses the key 7, they need to tell B what that key is. Uh, a simple way to think of the key is I tell you what mapping to use. Okay. I tell you, before I send the encrypted information, I somehow tell you that let's use the mapping and the ordering is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, you know that that means 0, 0 will map to 0, 1, 0, 1 to 0, 0, and so on. So I tell you that mapping. When I send you ciphertext 1, 0, then you know, ah, if you receive ciphertext 1, 0, we're using key 7, the plain text must have been 1, 0 in that case. So there are 24 possible keys, and a simple view of the keys is to specify what mapping to use. So we could say key 1 could be written as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Uh, that should be K2 here. here, Or K2 could be... Oh, no, it's not. I need to check that one. K2 would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. That would be the key. What's the length of the key? How, how many bits? The key in this case. I could write it as a sequence of eight bits. Those actual bits used in the mapping. That's one way to write the key. K1 is this sequence of eight bits. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. And I think there's a 1 down the below, below that shows that. So this is one way to implement a block cipher. Just allow every possible permutation of the plaintext values, where each permutation is selected by a key. This is called an ideal block cipher. How many possible permutations or transformations? 2 to the power of n factorial, where n is the number of bits of plain text. In our case, we had n equal to 2. An n bit block cipher takes n bits of plain text, produces n bits of cipher text. If we have a 2-bit block cipher, there are four possible plain text blocks and 24 possible permutations or transformations. If we have a 64-bit block cipher, we have 2 to the power of 64 possible plain text blocks, which is what? 4 billion billion or something. And the number of possible permutations is 4 billion billion factorial. And you cannot calculate that. Okay? 
for factorial at such a large number is, is too hard to calculate, or I don't have a calculator to do it. Very many, okay? Now, the, that's good. The more transformations, the better. But it turns out, in practice, it means that the key must be very large. With so many possible keys, the number of possible keys, or the number of possible transformations, is 2 to the power of 64 factorial. To represent or store that key requires a large amount of space. And that is a practical problem that we have to deal with. We want to make the key shorter so that somehow I can write it down and give it to you, or we can distribute it in an efficient manner. So an ideal block cipher we just saw, it maps an n-bit input to 2 to the power of n possible input states. The best way to understand that is through this example. This is an ideal block cipher where n is 2. It maps a 2-bit input to one of the possible output states. The problem with ideal block ciphers is that they're good for security, but if we use a large block, n is say 64 bits, then it means there are 64, 2 to the power of 64 factorial n possible keys, and if you try and represent that number of keys in a binary number, the key is very, very large and we cannot distribute that key very well. So with large keys, implementations are usually slow and that uh, distributing them is a problem. So using a large block requires a large key, which is not practical. So the idea then is to use a small block. But it turns out, and we'll see through some examples, using a small block, like two bits, it's very easy to break. So what we need is a large block like 64 bits, but a small key. And what we'll see next week is that some people have come up with ways to do that. Large blocks, smaller keys. Feistel was one of the earlier people who come up with a structure that does that. And we'll see that next week. And we'll see it's very common in most ciphers used today. That's enough detail.